I moved to Doha, Qatar, and worked for Al Jazeera for a few years. I was stationed on the borders between Jordan and Iraq. My story, my assignment was to write about the refugees who fled the war and came back and came to Jordan escaping the war. Perfect is the enemy of the good. So you are actually your own enemy by trying to be perfect. From the city of Beaky Blinders, Birmingham, England, I would like to introduce you to Paddy Dandar. As the world becomes more automated and the robots take over, it's imperative that we build the right human skills for the future. So pull up a chair, grab a smoser or two, and make yourself very uncomfortable. Dear friend, Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Superpower School podcast. I'm your host, Paddy Dander, and on today's episode, I have a very special guest. Someone who has some superpowers that I personally would love to acquire. So I'm going to be listening with close intent and intention. She is a journalist, an author, a ghostwriter, and she's all the way from the US. Welcome to the show, Natasha Tynes. Hi. Hi, Patty. Thank you for having me. You're welcome, Natasha. What superpower would you like to bring to this episode? Well, it's, if you want to call it my superpower, and it's my only power, which is writing. I've been a journalist, writer, ghost writer for, let's say, over 25 years. So now you know how old I am. <laughs> but I started when I was three. No, I'm joking. <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, so I've worked as a journalist since I was 19 years old writing for newspapers in Jordan, in Amman, Jordan, where I was born in the Middle East. And then I moved around, as I told you while we were chatting earlier, that I moved to London, England, got my master's in international journalism, then moved back to Jordan, worked for the Jordan Times. It's the only English daily newspaper in Jordan. Then I moved to Doha, Qatar, and worked for Al Jazeera for a few years as a reporter. Then I moved to the U.S. with my husband, who is from the U.S., and worked in nonprofits, training journalists all over the world. So we used to travel, organize conferences, trainings is great. Worked for the World Bank for five years in their communications department. And now for the past three years, I established my own LNC. So what I do with this LNC is I provide content for clients. And so... Mostly, I provide newsletter support. So if there's any brand, they want anyone to write their newsletters, I do that. I do a lot of ghostwriting, mostly memoir ghostwriting through a company that got, they contracted me. So, and I love this part of my job, which is I talk to people usually in their 80s or 70s, and they tell me all their life stories the happiest moments, the regrets, what would they change? So for me, it's a very rewarding experience. And I also write fiction, published a lot of short stories and published a novel almost five years ago called They Called Me Wyatt. It's a murder mystery set between the US and Jordan, working on two other books, also fiction. So yeah, I, so that's what I do. So I, I guess that you can call this my superpower since it pays my bills. So let's call it a superpower. And if you're watching the video version of this, there's a stack of books next to you as well. So uh, a true author and writer just there. There we go. And <laughs> I mean, I was looking at your website and you've had articles published in the Washington Post, Esquire, The Post. You mentioned Al Jazeera. I mean, these are huge names in the world of journalism. So I'd love to explore more on that in a moment. But yeah, at what point in your life were you inspired to follow this career in writing? Was there a particular event that happened or was there a particular person that inspired you? Like, tell us a mm. bit more about that. Sure. So all of my life, I started reading at a very early age. That's what my parents tell me. And I've just been reading all my life. And it's like a natural progression. If you're a, a big reader, you would want to also like write. And it's just kind of the next step. So I've always been interested in writing. I think what got me into journalism, it's a story that I think I was maybe 19 or 18. 
and I wanted to get a, a part-time job. And so my friends told me about this sales job. I think you make sales over the phone and it's for a few hours. I was like, yeah, I want to do it. I want to I help with paying my parents, with paying the bills. I want to like do my own stuff. So I think I was maybe a freshman in university. So I go, I interview the guy, the person who was in charge. Everything was great. And he said, but we can't hire you. I was like, why? And he said, the morning shift is already filled. We only have the late shift. I was like, oh, it's okay. I prefer the late shift because I go to school in the morning. And he was like, no, we can't do that. I was like, why? Because the late shift ends after, I think, 7 or 8 p.m. And accord back then, it probably changed. According to the labor law, women are not allowed to work after 7 p.m. I was like, what? I was like, I don't have a problem. Like, if you're worried about my parents, nobody has a problem. It's only 8 p.m. I can do it. It's like, no, it would be like against the labor laws. So I was furious. So I wrote a letter and I sent it to the Jordan Times as a letter to the editor. And I wrote about my incident, like, and how can we do this? And it was still the standard. And I, I always got published and got responses. And that back then that I realized that this, that my voice can actually stir debate. It can start conversation. Maybe it can instill change. So that's, honestly, I left Jordan 20 years ago and I haven't followed in that issue. Probably it's fine now, but that was like over, I said over 25 years ago. And after I started getting those responses to the letter to the editor I sent, I started sending more letters to the editor and then Right after that, I started, I contacted an editor at a different newspaper and it was a weekly newspaper and I started publishing, I started because I like art and music. I started doing like music reviews and art reviews and, and then I continued and then I got a master's degree in journalism and this is how it started. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's, that's a phenomenal story. I wasn't expecting that actually, Natasha. I was just expecting <laughs> you'd you. read a book or <laughs> read an article. I know, it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a really powerful impact that you had there. And as a result of your article, did anything change or was there that sort of support for your argument that led to change? There, I mean, there, there were few supportive responses, but, you know, there, there, there wasn't a major change, but at least I started a debate, which mm. for me, that's good enough, at least for that time. And I said, probably the law changed now. I'll have to look into it. Yeah. So following on from your graduation, you got your master's. How tough or easy was it for you to land your first job? So it was easy for me because I was already publishing articles on the side before I got a full-time job. So while I was in school, I already had my own newspaper column. And the newspaper column was about, it was like funny about life in Amman, Jordan, and it was in English. So this kind of humor about living in a city in the Middle East and like our joke about driving with no AC and it's really hot and like all that stuff or being dragged to weddings and you have to like do like belly dancing and you don't want like all of that life in Amman. I was like my early 20s, like what did I know back then? But I thought I knew everything, of course. And so, and it got lots and lots of responses. And so at least in Jordan, I managed to establish a name for myself very quickly. And that led to a number of journalism jobs. And then came, and then I got a full scholarship to go to London to the achieving scholarship through the British Council, through the British government. Because studying in the UK for coming from my background, it's, we couldn't afford that. So the Chiefnik Scholarship provided with us with that opportunity. It was a great experience. So coming back to the Middle East with already published portfolio, a master's from the UK helped me like land jobs pretty quickly, like a job at the Jordan Times followed by a job at Al Jazeera and then, but it's not like I, I did not suffer when it comes to that, like in the US. I'm not sure if much about the U.S. market. There's a lot of jobs, right? But at the same time, it's at will employee. And in many, which means that it's, if they lose a, if they had a contract from a client, they lose the contract, they will lay off everyone. So 
Like I remember my first job was great. I was writing news articles and then they lost their contract. They made of five people. That's it. I mean, it's, this is kind of the way it is in a capitalist society is like you keep marching ahead. And uh, so, of course, I had my ups and my downs and all of that. But now I'm doing my own thing, which is it, for me, like I feel I already paid my dues in the corporate world. After five years, so now I have, I work with a number of clients and they find me either through word of mouth or through social media or through the website or through platforms like these. But yeah, it's been good. I have my, as I said, my, my good days and my bad days. Some months I'm really busy with clients, others not so much. So it's a journey. Just take us back to your days in Jordan because yeah, I'm really intrigued about life as a woman growing up in that environment. I have zero knowledge of Jordan. I mean, I've been to yeah. other places in the Middle East, like the UAE, that places that are yeah. quite touristy. But could you put into perspective, what kind of environment did you grow up in? And as a woman, like, how was that for you? So Jordan is pretty open. I used to go out and with my friends and I went to an all-girl Catholic school growing up, which the school was conservative. But, but you know, like the society as a whole is conservative, but I'm talking about 20 years ago. So some might argue, no, it's changed now. It's more open. People say no. On the contrary, it's even more, more religious and is more. So it depends on who you talk to, right? But. So like in terms of like finding jobs or whatever, it was okay. It was fine. I was well respected as a journalist. As I said, Jordan is pretty open and we have like female ministers and all of that. But I think the biggest issue as a woman growing up in Jordan was for me the freedom to choose a partner. And I think that's one of the biggest issues because it's, it's, it was still a conservative society in terms of dating publicly, at least back then, was frowned upon. So you would have to like date in groups or you won't be able to date until you're engaged or stuff like that. So that's for me was an issue because I wanted to have more freedom in choosing my life partner and not being forced in a situation where I had to because time was running out for me and like for a woman we have the biological clock and I won't be able to have kids if I wait long like all of these constraints and then the society would look at you as like a woman who's past her prime after a certain age and so all of these mental trauma that can mess with your head as a woman again 20 years ago growing up in in that culture and for me sometimes I joke about why of course there's every there's no perfect society like I love being in the U.S. but the U.S. has many issues and I love being in Jordan and the U and Jordan has also many issues so there's no utopia but one of the things that I like about (laughs) the U.S. or like maybe a country that's more open with Europe or the U.S. is I always joke about it is like I can put my AirPods and walk in the street and sing. Nobody even looks at you, right? Like people are busy with their own lives. I don't think I can do that in Jordan woman alone walking, singing. I think I would attract a crowd. Maybe when I was younger, now I'm old lady, nobody looks at me. But like when I was younger, they would do that, right? And it, I wouldn't feel comfortable doing that. But for me, this kind of simple act of freedom as a woman, I think makes a big difference. I can kind of relate to that world where you're sometimes torn between two (laughs) countries. So my mother and father came from India originally to the UK back in the probably late 50s and 60s. And I was born here in the UK. So when I'm in India, people say, oh, look, he's a foreigner. But then in the UK... Most people will address me as, oh, you're Indian, right? And so yeah. sometimes I'm like, well, I'm British Indian, but yeah, know, I, I'm going to make the best of both worlds. So yeah. it's sometimes nice to kind of pull the cultural side of India into my life as well as have the liberal side of the UK. But well. see, the difference is I was born and raised there. So I spent 20 years there. So yeah, absolutely. Well, most of your childhood is from that land. I came out of age in Jordan, pretty much. And 
Natasha, could you put into perspective the sort of pressures that you have to work within? Because I've never worked within that industry before okay. in terms of journalism. And I, but I know lots of other industries, we all have different types of pressures. And for mm. many of our listeners that are sitting at home, if they reflect on the jobs that they do, you know, they'll have these pressures on them as well. As a journalist, what sort of pressures are you under? So it depends if you're a full-time journalist with a newspaper or if you're independent. So I'm independent now. So I like I don't have lots of pressure because if I don't want to work for this new, this newspaper, I don't work for it. But the pressure comes from after you publish an article and you get the feedback and you there are always people who don't like what you say in anything. And it, it could be a very, like, I remember it was a very, uh, like a topic about soccer and it was like, oh, I want to force my kids to play soccer because I, like something, it was just uh, like, shall I force them or shall I give them the option? And it was published in the Washington Post in the parenting section. And it was about my experience with maybe I should like push them and should I force them? I got so many hate emails about who do you think you are? You're forcing your kids. You're a bad mom. Like there's always anything you say, somebody gets offended in anything. And, and it depends if, of how you look at it. You can, it can either crush you or you can either move on. So after years and like early in my career, I remember once, I know this is probably, I know in retrospect, it was, it, it was a mistake what I wrote. I was saying, yeah, and this artist is something like running his show for the affordable price of, and then the company called like, how dare you say this is affordable? Who are you to say this is affordable or not affordable? And like, they, they felt I tarnished their reputation by alluding to the fact that their tickets were expensive and that the. And using the word affordable in takes away the objectivity of the journalist, which is, I think they had a point in retrospect, but they called the editor of the newspaper, the, I think it was like an art studio and they complained about me to the editor and the editor had to talk to me. It's only about this one word. So this is what some of the struggles is that any, anything you say about any, like very, like it's not politics. It's not like social just issues like social justice or any of that, that. It's like simple topics about a play or a soccer and people will get offended somehow. And you have to deal with it. You have to learn how to have a thick skin. And so my rule is I allow myself to get upset for like two hours. I say, okay, get it out of your system. You have two hours, get upset. And then, okay. Let's move on. Let's control our thoughts and, and move on. But this is how I deal with it. So that, that's, I think, my main struggle is the feedback from others. Yeah. Uh, whenever I post on social media, I'm always conscious of the reaction I might get. And yeah. I generally have had positive sort of comments. I can't really remember any one post that's created any bad feeling. But there's always the odd one here or there. And yeah, yeah. That's, that is terrifying because... You feel like there are certain things you then don't want to debate out in the open on social media because yeah. you'd much rather have a conversation. But then Correct, yeah. if somebody has made a point, then you've got to respond. And that's my, my always my fear about publishing stuff and putting it out there. During your time as a journalist, like how many articles have you ever written? Have you ever counted? No. You can count them for me if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> I need some AI help on that one, but is it in the hundreds, thousands, do you think? Or I've been writing since I've been 19. I'm 47, so let's say 20 articles a year or more. Oh, wow. So a lot of articles. And out of all of those articles, is there one or two that are really memorable in that they stand out the most for you? And if so, for what reason do they yeah. stick in your mind? It would be the one that I wrote the first day of the second Iraq war. Because I was stationed on the borders between Jordan and Iraq. My story, my assignment was to write about the people who fled or the refugees who fled the war 
and came back and came to Jordan escaping the war. So we would wait by the border for a bus of refugees. And for me, I felt bad because the minute the bus stopped, all the journalists like attacked them. And the bus went inside like these poor people. The journalists were all over them trying to get a quote or a story of what happened to them just so that they can have a good story, I guess. And it was the very first day of the war. So there was a lot of interest in getting the human side of the story. But, you know, I tried to be very understanding and get stories about so I remember I talked with Sudanese refugees who left Iraq. They were based in Iraq and they came to Jordan and they were carrying their kids and, you know, how the war affected them. And it was, and at the same time, we were very scared because there were bombs right across the border falling. And I remember I was like really high on adrenaline that... I, and maybe that's a bit dangerous because I was so focused on the story that the fear disappeared and I ran on the adrenaline more than the fear of maybe what if a bomb falls across the other side. So, but anyway, we were okay. And it was the main, it was the main story on the very first day of the Iraq war in Jordan and the Jordan times. So. I thought I did, I did a good job. And I remember back then we were like in the middle of nowhere, the desert, and we had to go to like a government office. And I wrote the story by hand and I faxed it to the editor. That was the only way. I mean, so there was, look, I couldn't type it on my phone. There was no iPhones. There was like, there was a cell phone, but it's not like there was Wi Fi or anything like that. So I wrote it by hand and I sent it as a fax. And it made it to the front page of the store. Wow. I mean, in a world where we are constantly using apps and gadgets and technology yeah. for everything yeah. to to then be able to just use old fashioned pen and paper. Yeah. I mean, I didn't wow. have a choice. I wrote it by hand and I faxed it. Yeah. Wow. And the fact that you faxed it as well, which is, again, another sort of technology that nowadays is rare that people talk about. Yeah. That's yeah. really interesting. I'm that old. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, yeah. I was talking today on LinkedIn. Somebody put on a post and they said, you know, what's your preference? Do you prefer to read books digitally or on paper? And I was like, paper all the way for me. I've yeah. got to have it in paper. I just love that smell of the paper, the, yeah. the flicking of the pages, sticking yeah. post-it notes on yeah, the pages that I want to go back to. Highlighting. My... Yeah. So yeah, it's paper all the way. So that, I'm just as old fashioned, don't worry. We're in the same place. <laughs> and Natasha, so if somebody out there is looking to ramp up their writing skills, and I'm going to put myself in that group because I have recently started my newsletter, I'd love to get some advice from you in terms of how to get better at writing and, and okay. love to get some tips from you on that. So could you share some of your wisdom of on this topic? Well, if you want to call it that, but yeah, sure. So first thing is read. I mean, that's the number one rule is, you know, you're, you will never be a good writer if you do not read in any topic. So if you want to write fiction, read fiction. If you want to write nonfiction, if you want to even like newsletters, just like imitate, then innovate. Look at what others are doing. Look at their styles and then come up with your own style as well. Do not try to sound over smart or over complicated. Try to be straight to the point, read out loud, and then get rid of what I call them empty calories. And these empty calories include words like very, really, just that. And now with AI, some AI tools can help you identify them and just get rid of them. But just keep that in mind that these empty calories, they don't add much to the copy. And if you're talking about newsletters, your number one KPI is, of course, the open rate, right? So like you want to have an open rate 40% or more. And from my experience, what makes it sometimes what makes or breaks an open rate is just the title of your email. And I experimented with that so many times. And I realized the one that works is a short, informative, but witty title that would grab the attention and it should sound human, not 
robotic. Like, do not put a title with like, buy my course or two days left until my course ends. And do not be too salesy in the newsletter. Let's say my newsletter is about writing, okay? And I want to talk about, as a writer, we tend to procrastinate. So I'll have a title like, I finally slayed the procrastination monsters or something like this, right? Instead of like tips on how to beat procrastination or take my course on how you beat procrastination. People are not going to open this, but use words that evoke emotions, monster slaying, for example, or people are also like words that has like ne- a negative connotation. Some people would say, I failed. And people are going to click, hi, you failed, let me see. But if you have the same newsletter and the headline is, I'm blessed, people are not, like, I'm, they're tired of like, I'm blessed the post. They want to see how you fail. So like, if, so people want sometimes to see negative emotions because they can relate to them. I'm not saying always to be like this on a downer or whatever, but try to evoke emotions in the time in a very short, humane, not AI sounding. Like let them realize that this was written by a human as well. And that's as well now in this age and time, distinguish yourself from AI as well by, by evoking these unique emotions that AI will never be able to do that because they don't feel they're machines. That's given me an idea. What might be a good provocative title for this episode, do you think? Could you give me some examples? For this one, something like the journey of a writer from the Middle East to suburbia or something like this. <laughs> something like this. <laughs> oh, I like that. That's quite adventurous. It sounds like an adventure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we'll be going on an adventure there. And I like that bit at the end. So we're actually giving some contrast from yeah. here to here. And I think like that's... from war zones to suburbia or... Like there we go. The sleeper cell, like the sleeper cell in suburbia. I'm just joking. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but I get the idea. That's like, so, so make it intriguing, but like you say, make it human. And the other piece you said there around create some emotion or emotional Correct. connection with the audience. Yeah. I mean, the other big problem I have is I'm a bit of a perfectionist. And okay. I was trying to launch a blog a few years ago. And every time I went to publish even my first blog article, I would stop and go, oh, it's not good enough. I've got to tweak yeah. it. I've got to tweak it. And in the end, I just, I had all these articles, but I never published them. And they were always like, oh, then it's not good enough. Even now when I write the newsletter, I'm like, should I publish it? Shouldn't I? Or what, is there more I could add here? What's your advice there if somebody is yeah. overthinking things? Because I know I am overthinking. So I always remind myself that like perfect is the enemy of the good. So you are, you're actually your own enemy by trying to be perfect. Sometimes you have to ship your products, even if they're not perfect and follow the, the thinking of startups where they called MVP, minimum viable product, right? So sometimes if, and then you can edit it later on, it's fine. But at least the minute you hit publish, you're done with that and you can go back to it. But if you keep like, like if you keep being like Don Quixote, like battling all these invisible enemies of perfection, you're never going to get there. So slay the, <laughs> slay the dragon, publish, and remember perfect is the enemy of the good and you can always fix it later. And just go with the attitude of MVP, minimal viable product. I'm just going to ship it. It's good enough. I will perfect it later. But that's the only way you can do it. Otherwise, what is the other option? Just sitting on it and not publishing it? Is Are you going to be okay with? And what is better, to not publish or to publish something that might need tweaking later? Like it's it's mind hacks. It's mind games. Yeah, I get that. Absolutely. And in the past, done talks on better storytelling for presentations Mm -hmm. and there are lots of different story arcs and I know you do quite a bit of work in this space as well in terms of storytelling but for articles blog articles is there a structure that you would recommend we follow there are there any kind of acronyms that we could use or any simple structures that you would suggest so the structure that I like to use that I think works well is start with a personal story 
and which is kind of the hook that will hook you. And then when you end, and then you make the point and then at the end, go back to it. So for example, remember the story I told you about, they didn't give me the late shift because I'm a woman. I can start with that. And then I make my point, let's say the law changed and law changed and everything is good. And we're all come by, whatever. And then at the end, I would say, I would end like, and maybe the 20 year, the 20 year old version of myself would have never thought that this actually would have been possible. I would go back to the same man and I told him, see, I told you so, oh, something like this, right? So. I take, I take the reader into a journey, starting with the personal story and then making my point, the conclusion, the, the statements. And then I go back and I close it the same circle with the same story of the man who told me, no, you cannot work. So this way, the reader is engulfed into this word that you created. I know it's only a blog, but you take them into that journey and just close the journey at the end. Oh, now I'm going to send you one of my newsletters. Sure. I would love your feedback because... Of course. Yeah, because I've tried to weave personal stories into it, but I bet there's so much more I could do and, and so much improvement I could make. So I, Just remember mind. like TED Talks that you les- listen to or anything. You probably don't remember anything. The only thing you remember is a small story that they mentioned. Like My mom once told me and that would stick with you and you forget all the tips and whatever, you just remember the story. And that is the power of stories. We, people connect to them because we are, we've always told stories around the fire, around what, you know, that is, that's what we are as humans. We tell stories. So that's the only thing people are going to remember. You're going to forget everything else. Just going to remember the story. And talking of human skills, (laughs) we're living in a world of AI. I mean, even when we joined this Zoom call, I said to you, Natasha, who's this third person that's joined? And you said, oh, that's just my AI, Paddy. That yeah. I normally get him to sit in on my meetings. And I was like, whoa. So in a world of AI and the way things are going at the moment, if somebody out there is thinking of becoming a writer or even enhancing their writing, should they bother? Because surely AI is going to do a lot of this for us and it's become a lot easier that I can put in a few sentences and just get AI to now create the whole article for me. What's your opinion on that? So you can either be scared of AI or you can be excited about AI, right? For me, I'm the team that is excited about AI because I make AI work for me. AI is literally my assistant. So AI can help me come up with, let's say you want a blog post, right? And they can just give you the first draft and you can never use the first draft because it's very robotic, right? But at least having the first draft would cut the fear of the first draft because sometimes looking at an empty canvas is very daunting, right? But if you already have the first draft, immediately your your mind like beats procrastination and you get to it. So this is what my AI helps me is gives me, it helps me get rid of the fear of the empty canvas, right? So instead of writing, let's say five, one blog a day, I can write five blogs a day. And again, you can never depend on them to have the whole blog post because it's very robotic. So they can give you some ideas. They can give you like, he's like, the, he or she are the, your assistant. Ah, like, don't forget to talk about this side of the argument. Ah, okay, that's a good reminder. And you build around. So for me, AI saves me a lot of time, productivity. Uh, I have my own virtual assistant does the research. Of course, I have to follow after them because you can't always trust your virtual assistant. You have sometimes to do some follow up. And double check. But yeah, I mean, for me, it's great. And you can never replace a human writer again because humans feel. AIs do not feel. No matter how text you give them to understand feelings, they can never understand feelings as a human. They can never describe feelings as a human. You have to be a human to feel and to express that in your writing. So AI can never compete. Could you recommend any tools that you use just in case if somebody is thinking about utilizing this additional power? Because I, at the moment, just use chat GPT just in its basic form, but I'm sure there's loads of other really good ones that I could be using. So there's different AIs for different things. So for example, Otter that you saw join the meeting, it's a subscription tool. 
So sometimes when I interview people for the memoirs or the people that I ghost write their memoirs, I use Otter records the, in, the interview for me and then transcribe the whole text and then divide the text into chapters. So I have my assistant, they came, they listened to it, they highlighted what's important and they gave me the first draft. I mean, imagine how much time that in the past you would either transcribe the whole thing manually or hire someone to do it. Imagine the hours that the assistant, and not only that, but they went through the script and they said, oh, okay. And they divided the script into chapters and sub chapters. And then you look and you see, ah, oh, okay, I want to expand on this. I want to expand on that. So that's one tool, for example. So chat GPT, you can use it as for writing everything from a proposal to a blog post or another thing I use is Bard, which is the Google version of chat GPT. And sometimes I put chat GPT and Bard and compare the results. I also use, of course, Grammarly. I have the Grammarly Pro for to get rid, to, to fix your language, typos, sentence structures. There's another tool called Hemingway where you put your draft and would give you a reading of your draft and try to make it read depending on the grade level that you want to present it to people. I also use video editing AI, like video.ai, and that's for me for my own podcast. It goes through the script and then it picks clips for me. I don't even have to listen to it again. Cuts it for me and gives me the templates. And all I have to do is to approve it and tweak it done. I used to hire a video editor for that. And you can say maybe AI got rid of the, the job of the video editor, but no, now it's freed some money for me to hire maybe different people. But and I'm still hiring, right? But uh, AI freed some money to do other stuff. So I use AI to do clips for my podcast and it's two minutes. I'm done. I have like 10 clips. And it's very smart. They pick good quotes from the interview. Like they don't pick random stuff. I did actually come across one, but I haven't managed to use it yet. But somebody reached out and said, hey, try our tool. It does this type yeah. of thing. Very similar to what you yeah. said there. But I was yeah. like, oh, I don't know. Might be hit or miss, but I might give it a go. So Natasha, we're running fast out of time. If people would like to get to know more about the work that you do mm -hmm. and they would like to continue their learning journey, could you suggest some resources that they could have a look at? For me as a writer, Twitter is, I know that tw Twitter is like becoming very controversial and Twitter X, whatever, but I still go there. I, I have a very good community. And so finding your people is amazing because you learn from them. You help each other out. You share resources, all of that. I also go to LinkedIn as well in the same community of writers. I, I go to LinkedIn and interact with them. If you want to like maybe take a, a writing course, very good one is Rite of Passage by David Perel. He has, and I took it as well. It's an amazing immersive, six-week immersive experience. Another resource is, there's lots of books on writing, like Stephen King on writing. That's kind of the Bible of writing. That's the important book to check out. And then just follow other writers like Jane Friedman. She has a very popular newsletter all about writing and publishing as well. If you want to publish books and self-publishing versus finding an agent, we can go down the rabbit hole of that one. But Jane Friedman and newsletter is a good one. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's just find your community online and start by writers you admire and follow who you follow and then interact with them and build your own community. Fantastic. And Natasha, how can we get in touch with you and check out your work that you do? Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm online everywhere. <laughs> NatashaTimes.com is my website. You can find me on Twitter, Natasha Tynes, Instagram, Natasha.Tynes, TikTok, all of these places. I have a novel if you're interested. It's a murder mystery. It's set between Jordan and the US. It's called They Called Me Wyatt. Um, yeah, so please feel free to, and you can email me as well. Feel free to reach out anytime. I usually respond quickly. And yeah, well, thank you for having me and allowing me to share my thoughts on this platform. Oh, no, you're welcome, Natasha. And you definitely do respond quick because that's how we got in touch. And uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you responded to my email. So I really appreciate that as well. And it's been a pleasure 
I know you've had a niggly cough and thank you for battling <laughs> through this episode, even though you weren't 100% feeling right. But I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much.